Okay, our uh, meeting tonight will be in a couple of different phases. This first part of our meeting is an actual public <coughs> hearing, and we have four items on our agenda tonight for public hearings. And so the uh, first two items, uh, ordinance number 01-19 and 02-19, are both the second reading uh, of these ordinances. Uh, three and four, these are the first reading of these ordinances, and so there will be a, or as I say reading, a hearing. There will be another hearing on these on the 28th, so there will not be any action on those that are listed there as new business, uh, zero three and zero four. This is the first of two public hearings. So what we're going to do, we're going to take these in order. Anyone that would like to speak on these ordinances we're going to ask you to come up to the podium so you can be recognized and have the floor and also so it can be picked up on the camera. We need you to state your name for the record and then you'll have five minutes to deliver your comments about that one ordinance. So you may want to speak about all of these ordinances or maybe more than one of these ordinances tonight, but we're only going to take them one at a time. So we've got a good turnout here tonight. I'm sure many of you are going to want to speak. So we're going to need everyone to help us keep the flow and keep things moving for everybody staying on point for that ordinance and limiting your comments to five minutes or less. And so Robert's going to be our timekeeper tonight and we'll give you a one minute warning. When you get to four minutes, he'll hold up one finger to let you know that you've got one minute to wrap it up. And at five minutes, he's going to ask you to stop so we can recognize the next person. So ordinance 0 0119 amends language in chapter 34 regarding land development to include and adjust the public nuisance ordinance of 2004. It would also add chapter 12 in the county ordinance or code of ordinances regulating buildings and building construction of second reading. So who would like to be first? Yes, sir, come on up to the podium. <coughs> Gary Williams, <clears throat> I spoke briefly at the last meeting, and uh, there's a correction to the minutes, but I guess when we get to that, I, I'll have to bring it up at that point. Um, Mr. Whitfield, the taxpaying citizens of Walker County, I'd like to ask you, Commissioner, to throw Section 34 and Section 13, what the old high school teacher used to tell us, File 13 in the garbage. You've talked about these before. You talked about them last night. All you basically said was blighted properties and you didn't show the real burned out building last night. I don't know why, but you did previous week. Those, some of the worst looking buildings, okay? Uh, that's, all, that's really all I got out of that you said. You didn't really go into any detail what this document says. Uh, I'd like to read because I don't know if people have read this and I'd like to make a comment uh, on the whole document you know I mentioned last week or two weeks ago about the uh, complaining realm that's still in this document and, and I believe uh, the county lawyer uh, explained that last week and said that Nobody's going to understand it unless you're a lawyer. So why would you want to put a document out here that nobody can understand unless they've been to law school? Is what I'm asking the public, not you, sir. Uh, I want to say blighted in direct means a construction as defined in this section. And this is section 12-52, page 8. Defined in this section as construction and defined in this section or property within a county which is constructed or maintained in violation of applicable codes is unfit for human habitation or commercial industry or business use or occupancy due to inadequate provisions for ventilation, light, air, sanitation, or open spaces. Poses an intimate harm to life or other property due to fire, 
flood, hurricane, tornado, earthquake, storm, or other natural catastrophe. Well, that covers a lot of ground right there, I think. It is vacant and used in commission of drug crimes, is occupied and used repeatedly for commission of illegal activities, including facilitating organized crime and criminal enterprises. After written notice to the owner of such activities conducted therein, is abandoned, has graffiti or any exterior wall or facade visible from private or public property, has wooden boards, plywood, other wood based material or any other non-transparent material covering, covering any window or door, has visible exterior deterioration included but not limited to, and I'm going to repeat that, but not limited to faded, chipped, or peeling paint, broken, loose, or missing siding material, broken, cracked, or otherwise compromised doors, windows, or other openings, otherwise constitutes an endangerment to the public health or safety as a result of unsanitary or unsafe conditions. Of course, that, that's one big sentence there with nine semicolons in it, which that's an uh, 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 awful big one sentence because each semicolon is actually, you know, a sentence in itself, but uh, it's all in one big sentence. One minute, will you Sure. One minute. Stop my time. Oh, I, got, I just got one minute? Wow. We're four minutes in. Wow. Uh, not, let's see. Let's, let me uh, let me just say that uh, I hope you value your signature. I hope you have read and understood and know what this is going to do to the citizens of this county. Mm -hmm. I firmly, I'm asking you, I'm asking you to not sign section 34 and 12. But the wrong way, start all over. If you're concerned mainly about those pieces of property and that's it, write up a different write up a different ordinance just pertaining to that property. Please. In fact, how much more time have I got? Because I could go into a lot more. We got let me say something about instrument in 34-65 it talks about an instrument being played. Uh, that uh, if I, what if my granddaughter wants to go out and play her French horn, if she played a French horn, if I had a granddaughter play the French horn and wanted to go out on the back porch and wanted to go on the front porch and, and play her horn and somebody, uh, I haven't got time to look it up because of my time, but it, you know, anybody could nitpick this thing to death. I disagree with it and I hope you don't sign it. I hope you value your signature. Thank you Thank very, you much, very much. much. Okay, who would like to speak next on this uh, ordinance 01-19? Anyone else would like to speak? I'd like to say something, but I don't know if it pertains to Mayor or not. Uh, if it pertains to this ordinance, or if well, it's... I I, like he said, it takes a lawyer to understand this stuff. <laughs> I'm just a farmer. I mean, I graduated high school, and I'm not real stupid, but uh, they put stuff in here that I don't have a clue to it. Anyone like to be recognized at the podium? Yes, sir. My name is James Powell. I uh, live in Chickamauga, Georgia. I live inside the city, but this has far-reaching effects. Uh, there's a group in uh, Rossville, the uh, Wilson Road neighborhood, uh, my good friend uh, David Roden is uh, trying to convince the cities to allow the counties to take over, the county to take over enforcement uh, of this ordinance within the cities and, and submit their authority to the, to the county, which I totally do not agree with and I don't really think it's constitutional. But I did want to speak to this ordinance. Uh, there's a lot of far-reaching things in this ordinance. Uh, people need to read it. People are uninformed. Uh, I try to uh, make people aware on Facebook. Uh, I put them an alert out there for people to read this thing. And I'm hoping it would be standing room only tonight. 
Uh, and I hope people, I had people that didn't even know what a utility trailer was. I had one guy ask me what a utility trailer was, and I told him that's thing you haul things on. Uh, if you got a utility trailer, you better get ready to build your building around it because you can't have it sitting in your yard. If you got a boat, you better get ready to build a building around it because you can't have it sitting in your yard according to this ordinance. Uh, this ordinance uh, covers a multitude of different things from even from your dog. It says that five people complain about you, then that qualifies to, to file a complaint against you in magistrate court. Now, on the plighted buildings, I called the, the Georgia Department of Revenue today and talked to the commissioner's office. And they were kind enough to send me what they think that our county attorney was trying to put in here. It is uh, reg uh, code 41-2-9, county and municipal ordinances relating to unfit buildings or structures. But this thing says it will be filed, a complaint will be filed in magistrate court. This says it shall be filed in Superior Court. Now, I believe this tops anything you put in here. If I remember correctly, state law tops your little local ordinances. So, uh, the, uh, another thing, it doesn't mention that this would be a tax. This thing says a special tax shall be created to recover costs uh, for uh, abatement of any property that uh, need, the county needs to go in and, and uh, correct. Well, this doesn't call it a tax. If it's a tax, then the voters in Walker County will need to vote on it. You can't set up here and pencil in a special tax and call it a tax. Now, it does say in here that it can be a lien be put against the property, but to call it a special tax and to try to run it through magistrate court, you're going against state law. I'll be happy to, get, to give you a copy of this, I got it. Uh, also, another thing that bothers me is the fines. $500 to $1,000 per day. Folks, on um, one minute, Mr. Powell. February the 20th, well, actually, this was published on February 20th, but on Wednesday before that, the Supreme Court ruled about excessive fines. Someone who draws $600 a month Social Security, and you have your code enforcement people go out because five of the neighbors complained. It don't even have to be five neighbors. Five citizens. There's 68,000 people in this county and five of them are going to complain and you're going to send a code enforcement officer out to write them a complaint, to write a ticket on them and fine them $500 per day that they don't get it corrected. You might want to read the Supreme Court ruling also. I know you went to law school. I didn't, but I, I've got sense enough to breathe, and I know how uh, this thing, this thing will come down to some kind of a court case, and it will be in state or federal court. It won't be in the magistrate court of Walker County. So I encourage you not to do this. If you do, it will be remembered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. like to be next to be recognized and speak on ordinance number zero one on this first ordinance yes come on up please I'm not coming up to speak on this but this, so this is the only thing that we're talking about at this time excuse me this gentleman just wasn't clear on which ordinance
can you just hear him out? Otherwise, he won't get hurt if he doesn't know yeah, what's going on. Yes, he's more welcome. You would, sir, would you like to come up here? Well, I will. I'd just like to know. Sure, yeah. Come on. Walker County. And yeah, come on up on. here so you can, we need to get your name for the record. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I didn't really want to bring attention to myself. I just want to listen. <laughs> take 20 minutes to say what I want to say, but anyway. Please state your name. John Romans. I live in Catholic. A little farm out there. I was there, I've been there 53 years, and that's my whole life. Cattle and hay is all I wanted to do all my life. And uh, I've got some old cars, antiques, some of them's diamonds in the rough, and I just wondered if some of that's going to be, you know, coming down on me. I heard something about issuing tags on all them things. So, I ain't got enough money to buy tags on all them all the time. I mean, you got to have insurance on them to get a tag. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that affects any of this on me, but I bought property that joins me that has old houses so I can put them in fence and let my cows run in there. I'm 73 years old. I'm still in pretty good health, but I, I've got four of them, actually. And there'll nobody ever live in them again. But if I tore them down, it's going to kill me. And I can't afford to stack all that good lumber. So they're better off just standing there until maybe my son or grandson can use the materials and build them a house someday. But uh, I just wonder if this affects me. See, I don't know. I haven't even seen this for the day. Well, just to give everybody an update, we've had some, uh, some good comments tonight and some other comments that have come in that, uh, that has brought some uh, attention that as far as junk vehicles, in particular or old vehicles or tractors or things that we need to take a closer look at how this affects agriculture which is what you're speaking of and so our intentions tonight on this uh, chapter 34 that portion of this we're going to table tonight as the uh, vision team continues to work on their recommendations for that and also for the uh, legal counsel to consult with them so the section 34 dealing with agriculture is under review and so therefore we're going to table that portion of this in the next phase of our meeting. Yeah. Well, see, another thing is, I'm scared to death I'm going to drop dead and my wife's going to have a nervous breakdown trying to get rid of some of this stuff. And I've accumulated a lot of stuff over, over my life. And I like old stuff. <laughs> and with these cars, you can't take cars like I got to the scrap yard. They, it's over then. They, you'll never see them again. In the 30s and 40s and 50s, see? I like looking at them. When I get tired of looking at one, I'll trade it for another and look at it for a while, you know? But I just, I've always had the fear that somebody's going to come out there and give me 30 days, get rid of all these cars, and there ain't no way a man can do it. You know, and that's my life. I love them. I love looking at them, playing with them when i got time, which ain't much. The farm keeps me so busy. But, you know, I've always had that fear that somebody's going to come up. But they hadn't, and I'm thankful for that. But, but I've heard about this, and there's no telling what's going to happen now. But I've heard you're a fire man, and usually you probably have to take each situation on its own merits. That's right. Instead of just a big broad brush, you know. But uh, you know, I could go on and on. But that's really the basics. Okay. I to do. Yeah, we're still working on that part when it deals with agriculture. Well, you know, that, I doubt uh, my cars would deal in with agriculture. I mean, Are you zoned agriculture? Yes. Yeah. So that's why I'm speaking of is your zoning. I'm yeah, sorry. I started out with 20 acres and I bought everything I could that joined me all my life. And uh, I moved out when that road was church. I, I hauled chert in and filled up potholes, hauled oil in and oiled the roads down. They put you in jail for that now. The <laughs> county used to do it. Yeah, that used to be the way, yeah, that's right. That's right. But uh, I just hope that, uh, you know, there is some mercy when they come knocking on my door. And, you know, but I, I am going to get rid of some stuff. Actually, I really am. I've sold five cars in the last year, lost four to five hundred on each one of them. But, uh, you know, it's time for some of them to go. But, uh, when he does, when he do knock on my door, just please give me plenty of time to do something, because I'm working on it now. Okay. Thank right. you, Mr. Appreciate Holmes. you coming very yeah. much. <laughs> Anyone else on ordinance number 0119 that'd like to speak before we move on to the next? Yes, sir. Come on up. <clears throat> my name's um, Randall Pittman, and I live up there in Rossville. My question here on this um, ordinance in the section 34 here, about the abandoned vehicles. 
<clears throat> Down here on the band of vehicles it says, there has no tag displayed on the vehicle <clears throat> or the owner cannot provide to the county police officer proof of insurance. If you got a car broke down <clears throat> and you're trying to save your money to repair it, you know, you're not going to insure it. You're going to um, have your registration suspended so you're not paying them fees too. Well, why unless you carry insurance on that car? Well, my understanding is that it's part of the state law requirement in order to get a tag. In the state of Georgia, all vehicles that are tagged have to at yeah, least have liability insurance. I understand that, but when you when you've had your registration suspended, you don't have insurance on it. Why must you carry insurance on that car if it's sitting in your driveway or on your property? I, I don't, but just for your knowledge, Mr. Pittman, that, and for everybody's, this uh, section 34, th this is not a new ordinance. This ordinance is already part of our county ordinance. So, I mean, it was enacted in 2004, long before any of us got here. The only things that, that are being affected by our action or inaction, depending on the way that we decide to do it, are those changes that you see marked through. So that, that particular provision I know this is not an answer to your question, but but I, I think it may provide you with a little bit of. So state law tells me guidance. if I've got a, if I own a vehicle, I have to have it insured and tagged, even though it's not operable. Is, is that what you're in order to get a tag, you have to have yeah, it insured. I understand that. Right, that's all I've got. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Yeah, that's a that's I'm glad uh, Matt brought that up. This. Chapter 34 is, is not new. We were just looking to make some amendments to this. This has been on the books in the county since 2004, that whole chapter 34. And we have just were making some uh, modifications and we've identified there's some additional modifications to be made as well. All right, anyone else on 0119? Okay, we're gonna, oh yes, well you've already, my wife would like to yield her time to me if that's possible. Well, we're not going to be able to, to do that, but if she would like to speak, she could. Okay, let me know. I just want her to, if she wanted to yield her time to me. Thank you. Said on TV, they could do that. Well, okay. after further consultation with our legal staff, we've made the determination we're not going to be able to do that because we knew we'd have a large crowd and to be able to give everyone fair time and to get to the other ordinances. But we're not taking any action on 34 tonight, so you can come back and speak at our next hearing. But you are on 12. Right? Very likely, yes. Well, I'm asking you not to. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to ordinance number 0 219, a uh, main language in chapter 46 regarding construction of road and county maintenance to bring current standards in line with surrounding counties. This is the second reading. Anyone like to speak to ordinance number 0219? Okay, last call, anyone? Okay, we'll say there's no action on that one. All right. Um, <coughs> okay, what we're gonna do, uh, this is probably gonna be a good stopping point for us because we've got some special guests that's planning to be here at 6.30. Uh, that we want to recognize on our proclamations tonight. So before we go into the new business, we're going to take a recess and we're going to start back at 6.30 so we can recognize those that are here for the proclamations. Or the proclamations for Down Syndrome Day in Walker County, proclamation for intellectual development disabilities, and also our proclamation for Social Work Month. So we're going to cover those three and then we're going to come back to our public hearing. But uh, due to... Uh, our friends and some of the time restrictions we've got, we want to cover those three proclamations uh, so they're not delayed in getting back home on time like they need to be. So we're going to recess until 6.30. Okay. I can get everyone's attention. We uh, respect your time. We want to get started. Uh, so if we can get everyone's attention. Uh, Thank you all for uh, working with us here tonight. This is a lot on our agendas, but this is a, a real special occasion to, to recognize some, some very 
uh, special people in our community and bring some awareness to some things. And so I want to read this first proclamation. And uh, it says, by the sole commission of Walker County, a proclamation down syndrome day, whereas March 21st has been selected to signify the uniqueness of the triplication of the 21st chromosome, which results in individuals having Down syndrome. And whereas each year, one in every 691 children are born with Down syndrome in the United States, representing approximately 6,000 births nationwide and 90 to 100 births in Georgia. And whereas while research and early intervention have resulted in dramatic improvements in the length and quality of life of those affected, more investigation is needed into this cause and treatment of Down syndrome. And whereas people with Down syndrome possess a wide range of abilities and are active participants in educational, occupational, social, and recreational circles in our community. And whereas on Down syndrome days, many groups and individuals will work to educate the public about Down syndromes and to promote the potential and contribution of those with, this condi with the condition. Therefore, I, Shannon K. Whitfield, sole commissioner of Walker County, Georgia, do hereby designate March 21st, 2019 as Down Syndrome Day in Walker County. Residents are encouraged to wear bright colored socks and share pictures of those socks on social media with the hashtag, lots of socks, joining a global effort to get the world talking about Down Syndrome. Signed and sealed the 14th day of March, 2019. So it's with great honor that I sign this. And I think we've got some folks with us tonight that, uh, we gotta test that, that are here for this special day. And so we want to take and uh, get them to tell us their name and if they're still in school, where they go to school, or if they're homeschooled, or whatever case, and tell us what their goal is in life, or what they want to do when they grow up. So who wants to be first? Me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so tell us your name. I said to Maggie, I was in Parkside. I wash dishes. Clean the stock room. Take our wax out. I was talking to people working in Parkinson's. And I got family named Mommy and Faith. No. And I got family is Sega, Grace, Tori, and Darren and Tori, and my family. And I love it. And I love. My mom and Faith and Daddy. It's me okay. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for doing this. We, got, we, need to, we need to get some pictures. Anyone else here that uh, would li like to speak for Down syndrome? You want to come up here with us? Come on around. Come on around. Yeah, you can come through there. Come on over here, buddy. Tell everybody who you are and how old you are. I am 12. And what's your name? My name is Silas. And your last name? Gazaway. Gazaway. Silas Gazaway, folks. And tell us what you want to do when you get older. Um, I want to be a fireman. All right. Yay. Yeah, we need some more fireman. <laughs> Did you bring your team with you tonight? Yes. And who were they? Um, Wally, Hunter. And Cordell and Woody. All right. Well, we appreciate you guys coming tonight and being here for this special moment. So I want to get a picture with both of you guys. We'll come up here and I want to give you a copy of one of these proclamations so you can take that home and frame it. I want to give you one. Thank you. Okay. And let's, uh, okay, let's go over here. There we go. Up here against the wall. Okay. That way we got a good backdrop. Thank you. Thank you. You guys come over here with me. All right, come over here a little closer. A little bit closer. All right, great guys, I appreciate you so much coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
appreciate you. You want to go back to your family? Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, our next one, and I know I think we've got some people uh, here with us tonight. So if you're here for the next one on intellectual development disabilities, raise your hand. I think there's several of you here. Okay, we're going to get y'all to come up here in just a moment. Uh, so, Commissioner Walker County, Georgia, a proclamation, Intellectual Development Disabilities Awareness Month, whereas intellectual development disabilities is a condition affecting an estimated 4.6 million of American children, adults, and their families, whereas the most effective weapon for alleviation of this serious problem associated with intellectual development disabilities are public knowledge and understanding. And whereas the potential for citizens with intellectual disability, development disabilities to function more independently and productively must be fostered and whereas Lookout Mountain Community Services improves the quality of life for the citizens of Walker, Dade, Chattooga, and Catoosa counties by providing services to persons with intellectual development disabilities and their families. And whereas the citizens of Walker County are urged to give their full support efforts enabling people with intellectual development disabilities to live productive lives and achieve their potentials. Therefore, I, Shannon K. Whitfield, so Commissioner of Walker County, Georgia, do hereby proclaim March 2019 as Intellectual Development Disabilities Awareness Month in Walker County, signed and sealed the 14th day of March 2019. So those of y'all that are here for this, if you want to make your way on up here, and if any of y'all would like to speak on this, Yeah, that'd be good if y'all want to speak. Tell us who you are and what your involvement. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, my name is Vicki Burst. I'm an employment specialist with Look at Mountain Community Services Colossal Health Program. And uh, I've been doing this for combined over with mental health and DD side almost 15 years. And I work with Evelina. She's been on her job for four years at Unique Fabricating. So I'll let her tell you something about her job. Um, more likely they put me doing that by Volkswagen when you come to your knee. Um, if you ask about anything about Volkswagen, I will tell you how many goes in the box, uh, what kind of small little labels I put on the part, um, how many parts we have for Volkswagen, but we do. Um, we got four hatches came in this year. Um, we do all kinds of stuff, but even cars and stuff. So. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much. Anything you want to add? Tell us a little bit about Lookout Mountain Community Services. Yeah, I mean, I'm the CEO. I'm Tom Ford for Lookout Mountain Community Services. We serve about 200 individuals. Uh, Evelina is one of our individuals working, and many of our individuals we try to get in supportive work. And uh, we serve about 200 of those, and we serve another 5,000 individuals with mental health and substance abuse problems. Very good. If y'all want to come over here, I've got some copies of this proclamation and bring awareness to this. Social Worker Month. Anyone here for uh, for this proclamation tonight? Okay, great, great. So we're going to let y'all come up. So if y'all want to be making your way up here, we're going to let y'all speak next. All right. By the Soul Commission of Walker County, Georgia, proclamation Social Worker Month, whereas the social worker profession is dedicated to helping meet the basic needs of all people, especially those who are vulnerable, oppressed, or living in poverty, and whereas Elevated Social Work, this year's Social Work Month theme, embodies the need to recognize the extraordinary communication of the professions in our society. And whereas the social worker profession 
is expected to grow faster than the average over the next seven years with more than 682,000 people expected to be employed as a social worker by the year 2026. And whereas social, worker, social work is deeply woven into our society with social workers active in government, schools, universities, social service agencies, communities, corporations, and the military and in the healthcare, excuse me, healthcare and mental health care settings. And whereas for more than a century, social workers' profession has been on the cutting edge of helping create changes to make our society a better place to live, including voting rights, improved workplace safety, a minimum wage and social safety net programs that address poverty and hunger. Therefore, I, Shannon K. Whitfield, so Commissioner of Walker County, Georgia, do hereby designate March as Social Work Month in Walker County and encourage all residents to recognize the numerous contributions made by social workers in our community, signed and sealed the 14th, 14th day of March, 2019. So tell us who you are and give us a little bit of background. Um, my name is Faith McGee, and I'm currently a student at Dalton State College, and I graduate in May. Um, I also work at Highland Rivers Health, which is like the sister company of Lookout Mountain, um, as an intellectual and developmental disabilities professional. Um, so I'm a case manager for the IDD side. Very good. Thank you. And I'm Jamie Davis. I'm also a social work student at Dalton State, and I'll graduate with Faith in uh, May. And so we're just excited that our community has recognized our profession because as social workers, we've been trained, and we know that um, community is something that's so important. In, in our profession and in the lives of the citizens that live here. And so community partners like Highland Rivers and Lookout Mountain Community Services are so vital. And so we're just thankful that the community that we love recognizes the profession that we love. Yes, thank you all so much for being here. But most importantly, thank you for what you do and for choosing this as your career to, to want to help help people and help our citizens. So thank you for that. I know that's a, a huge dedication. So let's get a, a picture with y'all as well. Let's give them another hand. take another just a couple minute breaks and see if we can adjust the air and uh, also to give anyone an opportunity that needs to leave at this time that has other commitments we know a couple of you do to give you an opportunity to, to uh, slide out without disrupting our hearing so thank you for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you back next year when we recognize these again it is uh, 10 minutes till 7 on March the 14th 2019 we're gonna go back to our public hearing new business ordinance 0-0319 implements title 48 chapter 13 article 3 section 51 official code of georgia placing excise tax on rooms lodgings and accommodations so who would like to speak uh, on this ordinance first if you'd like to speak you can come to the podium please uh -huh. <laughs> Hi, my name is John Affman and I own a lodge in um, Kensington that I've been operating for 18 years and uh, we have a meeting Monday and I am very disappointed because I thought we were having a couple more meetings to gather information. I mean, this is a commission meeting and I feel like you are not prepared because you don't know how many vacation rental homes are in Walker County. But we're not taking action on this one tonight. I know, it's just to but we're not ready. I mean, the people that came were 100% opposed to this. 100%. There's no one there that, you know, because we're all business owners. I went through and looked, and I counted about 50 vacation rental homes in Walker County that I could just pull up last night. Okay? 
that's 50 businesses that are bringing people into Walker County that are spending money. And, you know, this is going to be a major impact. And I'm not saying this lightly, but I don't believe, I mean, you talk about being pro-business, we're going to bring business in. You've got businesses that are operating in Walker County that are bringing people in, that are spending money here. And I know personally that, you know, my lodge has brought, brings in 1,500 people a year into Walker County to stay for an average of four days. I counted up last night. In the last three years, I've had people from 45 states that have come to Walker County specifically to stay here that all spend money here. And this 8% tax that you're talking about is very well could just be what puts me out of business because I have a very thin margin. I can't hire someone to run it like a lot of people do. I don't make enough money. I do it all myself. And I'm not here to talk about that, but I am honestly considering just forget it. It's not worth it. I mean, I bust my tail and now I'm losing 20%. If this passes 8%, 8% sales tax, my water bill's gone up, my everything's gone up, my taxes have gone up. You know, I don't, my business does not cost Walker County a penny. Not one penny is spent. I'm on a dirt road. I don't even have that. Uh, but anyway, you know, I just don't feel like this is a pro-business move. I don't feel like you're listening to the people that are here. I went online last night and I was looking and there's about 50 that I saw that are on Lookout Mountain, vacation rental homes, a lot of nice ones that are in Dade County that are sitting up there. There's all kinds of rising fawn all the way down and those people are just going to make a heyday if you pass 8%. The people in Walker County, they're going to have to eat that cost. They can't, I mean, most of them can't pass it on because it's not something, I mean, I know I tried to raise my price 50 bucks and I lost a whole bunch of business. I'm having to go down. It's very competitive. And you're, what you're doing basically, because Katusa doesn't have this, and I, I didn't even look in Katusa, but I know there's a whole ton on Lookout Mountain. And those people are going to reap the benefits of this 8%. People are going to go there instead of go here. And that's going to hurt the businesses that are here. I don't understand the rush. I don't think you really understand the full implications of this. You know, I don't understand what, why we can't table it and have, I mean, we had an opening discussion on Monday and here we are on Thursday already, you know, presenting it as the first hearing. And we haven't heard from most of the people in the county about it. You know, the hotel, which we talk, I understand that's coming and that's it, but that's two to four years away. There's no rush to do this. And I know, you know, you're wanting to fund the Walker Rocks, but it's like, you know, you're robbing the people that are already doing it to pay for something that says, you know, we're going to bring more people in and, and, you know, we're bringing the people in, but this is going to be a real hindrance. And when you look at the state, I know I mentioned this before, but there's 159 counties in Walker, or in the state of Georgia, only 45% even have this tax. That's uh, 71. Of the 71, 41 of those are at 5%, okay? There's only 16 in the state of Georgia. That's one, that's 10% that have 8%. You know, you're looking at going to 8%. You know, if you have to do it, I mean, my first thing is grandfather in the businesses that are there. You know, you're saying you can't do that and we explored that. Secondly, start it at 3%. Say, okay, if we're gonna do it, we can start at 3%. Give the businesses some opportunity to adjust to that you know, the way this is reading, it's in May 1st. I mean, my people are already booked for all through the summer, okay? They've already contracted the price. Who's gonna eat all that money? That's me, summer's my big time, okay? That's my main, I get half of my business income during the summer when families can come and have reunions. I'm gonna be the one that eats that because this is slated to start in May and these people have already got contracts. I've got contracts through December. I've got, you know, some for next summer. And those, those prices are set. I can't go back to people and say, hey, you know, I need another 8% from them. That just doesn't work that way. So my suggestion, strong suggestion, is that you look into it a little more deeply, that you consider, you know, what are the effects on the businesses that are here? And I mean, I know Walker County strapped for money. I understand that. I'm a supporter of Walker County. I pay my taxes early just to help, um, you know. But I'm just saying, 
you know, it's just not a pro-business move. I beg you, don't do it now. Let's look at it. Let's get a forum. Let's get the people involved. You know, let's find out how many people are here. Let's make sure they're on the tax rolls so that they're, they're paying the sales tax. You know, some of them probably aren't. I don't know. But I'm just saying that would be more revenue. But if you do that and you hike it to 16, I guarantee you people are looking, you know, do I want to start this business? I mean, this is a booming business across the United States. And if you got a 16% sales tax in place, that's going to be a very negative thing for people saying, you know, do I really want to deal with that? So that's what I want to say. And I really want to Just a little more information. The meeting he was talking about earlier in the week uh, was a meeting that we put together where we reached out to all of the uh, short-term rentals that we could identify in the county and asked them to come for some uh, discussion with the staff. So that's what Mr. Ackman was speaking of as we had a, a meeting. Probably went about two hours, I guess. A lot of good discussion, a lot of good input. And some of those ideas and input from that session will be implemented in the revised draft of this document. Okay, anyone else that would like to speak uh, on this ordinance number three? Yes? I'd like to go back to ordinance number one. You gave well, that gentleman almost eight minutes. No, we can't go, we can't go back. Come on. <laughs> wow. <coughs> All This is scary. I don't want no, to do it in front of people. Uh, my name is Melissa Tenney. Uh, we have a camp in uh, Lafayette uh, called Pigeon Mountain Crossing. Um, we, we have church groups, mostly church youth groups that come. And um, this tax will, I mean, it will hurt our business. I understand if we were a fancy hotel and you came and you booked one room, another 8%, you might think, oh, what's, if it's $100, what's another $8? You know, you might do that. But if you are a youth group of, with 50 kids that are coming to camp and they're paying you know, $50 for the weekend, but you're looking at your bottom line for your youth, they're going to go to Tennessee where they don't have to pay tax at all. I already have to be cheaper than in that area because they are nonprofits. So anyway. This tax will really hurt the little person. It will hurt those of us that are cleaning our own toilets and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. It will hurt us. Um, I understand that it's in hopes of taxing a big fancy hotel that is coming to town. I also understand that we don't 100% know that that's going to happen at this point. So to hurt us over not 100% knowing about that, and maybe maybe I don't know that, but I couldn't find anything that said that that was 100% gonna happen. Um, what else? Did I? Wonder about. Um, I know that if that does happen, they get a big tax abatement. What about a tax abatement for me? What about a tax abatement for John? What about a tax abatement for Hidden Hollow uh, for 30 years? Yeah, that would be super nice. Um, I would love for us to be grandfathered in somehow. I, I, I think there's a lot of, if you can offer a tax abatement to somebody, I think you could offer grandfather and the little guys in. Um, I also would mostly like to see a no hotel motel tax. I appreciate the Walker Rocks campaign. And who's heading that up? Is that, is that you? So collaboration would, with, with uh, our that, staff and the chamber staff. Well, I have talked to Mr. Wardlow, and he seems to be a very kind gentleman. I appreciate that, and and you're wonderful, and I appreciate that. And I I would love to see maybe possibly um, promoting tourism, possibly using like the Mountain Cove Farms, that has an unfair advantage over me because one they don't have to pay property tax because the county here in that and two. They don't have to pay insurance because they're under the county insurance umbrella. And I think possibly if we could take some of those funds to promote tourism, that would be great. Um, I would be willing personally to volunteer under Mr. Wardlow 
or under Ms. Wilson and help promote. You maybe you would could maybe we could promote Walker County by using Mountain Cove Farm money coming in and volunteer staff to work under the wonderful staff you already have. And possibly we could use some of that building because my understanding uh, the other thing that, that this excise tax, the proceeds from this excise tax goes into the county to promote tourism. But what it will actually do with these little things is it will make it hard for us to operate because it will cost us more money. And we're already promoting tourism because we're on websites that are advertising across the globe, actually. So if we could link up together and instead of paying somebody that really doesn't understand our businesses, if we could link up with them and not lose money and help with that effort, I think that would be great. So, I mean, I know, I believe that you guys are for business and it going well. So, I don't think you had any idea how many people you would be hurting with this. And I hope that's true. I thank you. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Okay, anyone else would like to speak on ordinance number 3-19? Yes. <coughs> Lacey Wilson, I'm with the Walker County Chamber of Commerce, and I have been out to Melissa's place, and it is absolutely uh, beautiful and breathtaking. Um, I think it's one of those places we don't even realize is in our backyard, unfortunately, because we don't um, have the ability right now to really promote our area. We have about a half a million people who come into Walker County every single year. They go to Rock City, and most people think they're actually in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They have no idea they're in the state of Georgia. They have no idea they're in Walker County. And part of that reason is because we're really not able to promote um, our county, to elevate the status of our county, of all of the great outdoor attractions and amenities that we have. Um, so we are in support of this. We are also the destination marketing organization as defined in section three. Um, I certainly understand the concerns of the small businesses represented here though. Um, we are in favor of it because it is at absolutely no cost to local residents. It is a tax that is passed on to visitors coming into our area. Many of us pay the same, very similar tax if you go stay anywhere else in the state of Georgia. Next time, check your receipt um, on that. But this is um, a tax that is very closely regulated. Uh, it can only be used for certain purposes for the enhancement um, of tourism. Tourism is a $60 billion industry um, in the state of Georgia and um, if this goes through we absolutely have every intention of working hand in hand with small businesses, large businesses alike to develop the, the best uh, tourism promotion plan that benefits all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And folks, I'd like to recognize Alicia Moore, the president, well, the chairman, chairman of the board of the Chamber of Commerce, who's with us here tonight too. And thank you for coming. for being here. Okay, anyone else like to speak to number three tonight? Okay, hearing none, we're going to move on in our new business to ordinance number 0-04-19 which would add chapter 14 to the county code and ordinance establishing the Walker County Business Code. Is anyone here tonight that would like to speak to ordinance number 04-19? Okay, Ms. Wilson. Two for one kind of night. Um, I just, I want to say I think this is a very uh, good thing. I think this is something that Walker County um, historically has been behind on and I appreciate um, the current administration looking into this. Um, in my role at the chamber, um, I talk to businesses all day, every day. Um, and when new businesses call, um, one of the very first roadblocks they hit when they're trying to set up a, a storefront is, okay, well, I'm in the unincorporated area in Walker County. You're telling me I don't have to have a business license when every business book I read says the first thing you need to do, decide if you're a sole proprietor or LLC, very second step, go get a business license. So um, I think it's more of a hindrance uh, than a help right now that we don't have it. Um, I think the fees are, are very um, reasonable, they're very fair. Uh, 
I think just to compare, um, Catoosa County implemented this back in 2009, or, yeah, 2009, so over a decade ago. So um, this is something that I'm in support of as well. I think this will help um, encourage uh, small business in Walker County and also uh, position us as a, as a place to do business. All right, anyone else like to speak to ordinance number 0419? And just a little follow-up, as Ms. Wilson was indicating, uh, these, all of these ordinances apply to just the county or the unincorporated portion of the county. In particular, number four there, all of our cities in Walker County, all five of them currently have a business or occupational type license process. And so it creates currently a lot of confusion if someone's looking to set up a business in Walker County, they, there's confusion if they need license because if they're looking at multiple properties, if they go, say, to the Rock Springs area that's in the unincorporated, but they go just a couple of miles up the road, then they don't realize they're in the city limits of, of Chickamauga. So it just brings confusion when, you know, why two miles down the road this, the, the standards are so dramatically different. And a lot of times people are needing business license to get set up with businesses uh, of other vendors and, and different type things. So this is a common uh, request that we get many times at the commissioner's office. They, they think the person that they're talking to on our end of the phone doesn't know what they're talking about. And many times they'll tell them, I don't believe you. Every county has a business license. I need to talk to the person that handles that. Please connect me. You don't know what you're talking about. And so there's been a form letter that was created years ago that the staff will say, well, I can email you or fax you this letter to put that to you in writing. And so we're trying to uh, uh, honor the request. Uh, the Chambers had this as part of their scope of work for 2019 and also to, re, you know, to be pro-business and to promote business in the county by providing them the tools that they need. Yes, Mr. Padre, would you like to speak? I have one question. Where are the proceeds for business license and for the uh, both, uh, excise tax, where are those proceeds going? Are they going to the county or are they going to the Chamber of Commerce? Okay, Matt, would you like to address that? Well, I, I think that the, the, the two different uh, sources of revenue, and so we've got to take them separately, but with regard to the hotel motel excise tax, it's defined under Georgia law where that goes. And so it's divided up into uh, three different types of categories. And I think the overwhelming majority of it, I can't recall specifically the percentage <coughs> off the top of my head, would go to the tourism product development organization, which in this case is the chamber. With regard to the uh, business and occupation license, fees that are paid, my understanding is that those would go into an account under the planning department of planning and, and zoning and would be accounted for through that office. Yes, sir. May I, may I ask, I'm sorry, I wasn't privy to that. What is the charge for business license? It's listed in the... I, I uh, don't have a copy. There weren't any left. Okay. So uh, yeah, let me read that off for you. It's a very good question since we run out of copies. Uh, let me find it. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is based off of a uh, number of full-time employees or full-time equivalents, uh, which is pretty standard in our market the way the other cities and all are tracking this. So from zero to five employees is $50 per year. Uh, six to 10 is $75. 11 to 25 is $100. Uh, 26 to 49 is $125 per year. 50 or more employees is 150. And then there's a uh, $25 administration fee. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Yes. Does this have anything to do with a separate ordinance that has to do with Mr. Brian Johnson, who wants to create a campsite hotel in a residential area? No, that uh, was a, a, a request that was tabled at our last meeting. And so okay. the Planning and Zoning Commission made their recommendation to the commissioner's office uh, to deny that request. And once we heard further testimony, we actually tabled that for further review. Yes, so sir. there's not any action on that tonight at all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, good question. Okay. My question about the hotel tax is, I, 
what I didn't understand was, to begin with, you guys are asking for the very top end of what you can tax in that. And it looked to me like in my research that possibly 5% went to maybe the chamber, and then the other 3% was to the county for things that were not tourism to do with as they wanted, whereas the lesser amounts were just about tourism, but the 8% meant 3% went to the county to do with as they pleased. Is that true? I'll have to go back and look at the statutory verbiage because you are correct. It, it did, the, the ordinance that we are using is based off of a model ordinance that was provided to us by the Department of Community Affairs. And so that's the reason why the, the verbiage in those latter parts is what it is. Uh, it, it is quite a word salad to parse through, but I, I do understand exactly what you're talking about. And I, 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 I believe that you are, yes ma'am, but I, but I would have to double check in order to make sure and a answer your question accurately. So 3% of that would be small percentage of people that would be for the county for the department. And we'll, we'll get that clarification. That's a great question. We want to get that answered completely, so we'll uh, get that information and, and attach it to the update and also uh, the next hearing we'll talk about that as well. So that's a good question. And my, other, my other question is, how does this become a law? How, does, how, did, how do you make this into a law that, we, that it actually happens? Okay, on any um, ordinance that a county would adopt, it's done by the governing body or the commission of the county. Uh, and at this time in Walker County, us being a sole commission that would take place in these public meetings uh, that we have twice a month when it's on the agenda, once it's been advertised for two consecutive weeks and there's two public hearings that are held. And then if, uh, if the desire was of the commissioner at that time to adopt that ordinance, then the ordinance would be adopted or either denied or tabled at that time. And, and, for, this, and for this provision, just to add on to that as, as well, man, there was some local legislation that was required before that general process that the commissioner just described was able to take place. And so we were able um, to get a local act back in 2018 from our local legislative delegation passed through the General Assembly to even allow that process to happen. All of that was advertised back in 2018 as well. So that local legislation was presented by somebody to the Assembly? Yes, ma'am, by Senator Mullis. By Senator Mullis to the Assembly, okay, in 2018. And so just with the stroke of your pen, you can choose to add 8% tax to all of our business. Once all the process has gone through on any type of ordinance, once the proper procedures are fulfilled, then it would be my responsibility to sign that ordinance into the, to the record. And so you don't have to vote on that type of tax because of, of this thing that went. Okay. Yes, but, but you can also choose to not. So that's, that's encouraging. Thank you. Okay. All right. That will end our uh, public hearing for tonight, and we're going to move into the second phase of our meeting. Uh, it is officially 7.15 p.m. on Thursday, March the 14th. Uh, you do have before you, <clears throat> we made available copies of our agenda. Uh, we've already uh, completed our, our pledge and our prayer. Uh, in the packets, you'll have the minutes from the two public hearings that were held on February the 28th. Any of those that have reviewed those, is there any corrections or things that need to be addressed in those minutes before we sign those into the record? Yes, sir. Yes. Two weeks ago, I spoke <coughs> briefly about uh, section 34 and 12, which I still just totally disagree with, control of the government. Uh, under it says another citizen, no, excuse me, it says Gary Williams, a citizen of Walker County, explained that not everyone could afford a new vehicle. He has a 2008 Nissan Quest that he uses as parts car. That is incorrect. I said I had a 2008, but I said if I wanted to buy a junk wreck parts car and use it for parts. I didn't say that I had one I used. I said if if I had one to use. Yeah. We'll make that clear. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay. Our clerks noted that, so we'll make that correction, get that updated. So the uh, first uh, meeting, so we actually had two um, on February the 28th. So the first one was on the uh, Mr. Johnson's request for the conditional use variance. Any corrections on that one? Yeah, just about, we'll get to questions at the end uh, of our meetings. Are there any corrections or anything on this one? Okay, we'll, we'll let you speak uh, at the end as well. All right, I'm going to sign these into the to the record. Okay, and then the. Uh, Yes. Uh, as somebody that's not as familiar with all the proceedings and meetings, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure what we were supposed to be just be looking at and responding to. I don't know where it is in the package. Okay, I'm sorry. Could yeah, I'll slow down that? a little bit. Yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> under our regular <laughs> scheduled meeting, uh, we have, uh, after the opening of the, min the meeting, we have the minutes. And so if you were able to get a packet of this, the second one that we have at the top says minutes of the scheduled public hearing. February the 28th, 2019. And uh, when you get down to item number three, it says uh, open a public hearing. Commissioner Whitfield and Legal and Policy Director Matt Williamson provided information on Ordinance 0-0119. So if you see that under the number three, we're uh, just covering the minutes to put the minutes into the record for that meeting, public hearing actually, uh, talking about the uh, the two ordinances and then also you'll see on page three all of these meetings are audio recorded as well and then there's reference to those public comments that shows the audio file and where that's located good thank you all right any other questions we uh will make that adjustment and enter those into our minutes that uh that was brought up to us we get that correct and make sure we have correct information Okay, the uh, next thing we have is the minutes from the February 28th regular scheduled meeting. Uh, this was where we did take action on items. The first two were just public hearings, very similar to what we had tonight. Uh, so is there any corrections or issues with those minutes of the regular scheduled meeting? Uh, hearing none, we'll sign those into the record. Also, too, uh, all of this information is on the website. If you go under uh, meetings and agenda, you can go back and look at any meeting that we've had since the start of 2017. Okay, uh, takes care of our minutes. And also items one, two, and three, we've already taken care of those proclamations. And again, thank you for allowing us to do that. Uh, item number four is the ordinance that we heard earlier from the second public hearing, which is 0-01-19, which adds chapter 12 to the County Code of Ordinance regulating building and building construction. As we mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to table chapter 34 because there's still work that needs to be done to that. Uh, this chapter 12 will allow us to be able to move forward on the blighted structures in our community. Our uh, planning director, planning and zoning director, tells us there's about uh, 300 plus uh, structures in our county that are dilapidated, that's not been lived in, that are falling in, they're collapsing on themselves. Uh, we've had eight other public hearings across the county in the month of February, and by far the blighted structures uh, at every meeting was the topic of conversation of citizens requesting that we take actions on these structures because uh, they are not only an eyesore, but they are also a safety concern in our community. And uh, they are also devaluing people's property. And so we need this ordinance in place to be able to start the 
due process that every property owner is entitled to. We can't just go in and start uh, going on private property and taking these structures down. There is a uh, property rights that we have in America where there is a due process. And so this will start the process for uh, the magistrate court for those people to appear before the judge. And so this is somewhat a lengthy process of all the uh, legal notifications and certified mail and stuff. So this will take some time to get rolling. But this does give the tools to start that. Anything additional? Okay, so at this time I'm going to approve this ordinance number chapter 12. <clears throat> This will be attested by our clerk. Okay, item number five is the ordinance 02-19 that we spoke about earlier that makes some uh, just adjustments to the specifications to the constructions of any new roads that would be developed in the county. So if someone is developing uh, most commonly a subdivision road this would uh, update the specification to mirror other counties in our market area as far as the, the amount of thickness of the gravel as the base and also the thickness of the asphalt that would need to be applied to uh, extend the life expectancy of those roads. So once they are turned over to the county, hopefully we can see a 20 or 25 year life expectancy before that burden to have to resurface those roads. Uh, we're seeing some roads now in our county that was put in into that 8 to 12 year time frame back under the other specification that are already starting to fail, that have already got structural base issues that uh, many of them are, you know, in that 8 years old range, which uh, should not be happening if we would have had a better specification. So uh, we will move forward in signing this ordinance into our minutes. Yes. So the 50 foot right of way, that's the entire right of way that's not the center of the road. That's correct, the entire right. right of way. And who is responsible to uh, inspect the roads to make sure that the base and all of the new regulations are being met? That is a uh, collaboration with our planning and zoning department and also our road superintendent. Okay, item number six is a facility management agreement with Idle Rock LLC. Uh, this is a standard form that is used anytime a uh, commercial development that requires a stormwater management uh, plan. This is an agreement of maintenance that is put and is recorded at the courthouse. Uh, so any parties or any transactions of property or anything uh, going forward would uh, notify anyone that does a title search on that property that there is a standing maintenance agreement with the county to maintain the stormwater on that facility at the owner's expense so it does not fall back as the expense of the county or on the taxpayers that is an expense of the property. <laughs> Be at the uh, expense of the property owner. So this is a standard protocol for this development, and we will sign this <coughs> into the record. This also requires the uh, signature of our attorney, and also notarized. And Charlene Robertson will be notarizing that tonight.
Okay, item number seven. This is a memorandum of understanding with our partners at Primary Health Center up in the Fairview area. Uh, they requested this. They needed this documentation uh, to use for their accreditation and, and other requirements that they have from other contracts that they're engaged with. Uh, basically, this just uh, validates that there is a relationship between the county and primary health care that they utilize our transit system. And so our transit system, uh, we actually transport about 2,000 or so uh, rides each and every month. And so, I'm sorry that's locked, but uh, this was something that they needed and uh, some memorandum of understanding. Uh, they are paying the, uh, the same published pricing and all that uh, other riders do. This is just to formalize this, to give them the tools that they needed uh, to carry on their operation. Okay, uh, item number eight is a purchase request of new computer software for our magistrate court. Uh, our magistrate judge, Sheila Thompson, was with us at our last meeting. If you wasn't with us, you can go back and watch her um, a video that she, she come and spoke publicly about her needs for a software system uh, for magistrate court. The system that they have will be sunsetting with the state across the entire state of Georgia. And so all magistrate courts are scrambling, trying to go to the new solution. So this was a uh, contract with a vendor case for case management system for magistrate court for the cost of the software is $15,000. Uh, there's a $250 per month uh, maintenance agreement. Uh, this, by executing this uh, agreement, will allow them to get in line for this to be converted over uh, and the installation to begin in January of 2020. But they've requested that we go ahead and execute this and bring this into the minutes of this uh, software agreement. Can we make any comments on that? Uh, we will at the end of the meeting. Sorry if we all have to sit through all these initials, but we have to do this in the public meeting. Okay. Over on the second page of your agenda, system acceptance <coughs> certificate with Motorola Solutions. Uh, this is the, uh, the document of a communication 911 tower that's in Walker County that is also shared with our neighbors in Catoosa County and also Dade County. And uh, this is a project that's been in the works for quite some time. I'm trying to find the page with the numbers on it. Next to last page. Next to last page. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so let me jump up here real quick. Uh, what this is, uh, with the discounted price, this is a $257,832 project to upgrade one of our three 911 communication towers. So this is being split uh, by one third each. So each county being Walker, Day, and Catoosa each are contributing $85,944 to this project equally uh, to get this project underway. And so we have with us tonight, Curtis Creekmore is our Deputy uh, 911 Director, Deputy EMA Director. So I've asked him to come and give us a little overview of what this is going to do for us. All right. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, Walker, Dayton, Catoosa County about 10 years ago joined into a partnership for emergency communications. So we're all on one seamless network that we share communication interoperability between all emergency agencies in the area. We actually partner with Chattanooga in our radio system extends up to Knoxville. Um, so we purchased 10 years ago, three towers and we put a tower in each county, one in Dade, one in Walker, and one in Catoosa County. Catoosa County had a older tower that there was some areas that was not covered on Lookout Mountain South that Canyon Ridge covers at the time. Um, we're in the process at the 10 year mark of upgrading the equipment that was purchased uh, throughout the entire system and that is covered by grants and warranty with Motorola. The single tower that we have to upgrade is an older <laughs> tower that we all three share the cost on. Uh, if we do not upgrade that tower, then we lose that site and then we will have a coverage, an area that's not covered in Dayton Walker County that is you know, vital to the, the operation of emergency services throughout each county. But again, it is shared through all three counties, the, yes. the cost is. Yeah, thank you. And as, as Curtis mentioned, this is a project of you know, joint communication that started 10 years ago. And my understanding, a lot of that was driven after 9-11 of uh, the communication hurdles that different agencies would have going into other markets on a, on a major yes, event. Sir. Yes, sir. And so this is to upgrade that tower because as he indicated, with other upgrades that are going on with the system, if this is not done, this one will end up sunsetting and we'll have a big gap and we'll lose coverage. Uh, this tower is very important to all three counties and it's amazing based off the data reports how much Catoosa County utilizes and, and bounces communications off of this tower due to the height and the location of this. And so this is something that is very important for us to get this done so we can uh, not have a communication failure. Uh, the cost was the 85,000 and change, I forget the number, but this is in our, this was budgeted for because, yes, okay, our cost is $85,944. This was an item that was, that's been in the budget that was planned for, and so they're not doing any changes to our budget or having to amend anything. This was in the budget that was adopted back for our February 1st fiscal year that started. The, the grant and warranty covers all the existing other towers that were purchased 10 years ago. This tower wasn't in the grant, and so that's why we have to fund this project. Okay. All right, thank you, Curtis, for speaking on that. Uh, last on our agenda is our February 2019 statistical data that we provide uh, every month, and we also showed the prior month on this report and we're also showing historical data uh, for all of 2018 and 17, and we have limited data in 16 for some of these items where the previous administration was not tracked at that time, and there's no data to capture uh, in the archives. So our animal shelter, our intake for the month of uh, February, there were 69 dogs and 14 cats. Uh, they were successful in getting 19 of those adopted. 42 went to rescues to go to good homes. And fortunately, eight of those were returned to the owners, uh, the original owners, and then we only had uh, one 
a euthanized dog that had to be put down. Uh, code enforcement uh, found 327 properties that were in compliance on their uh, street by street inspection that we've been doing for the last two plus years. There were 30 citations that were written on properties that were not meeting the current uh, property maintenance code ordinances that are in place. Uh, and in the month of February, there was four cases overall that were closed and brought into compliance, which is a very difficult task with all the rain and cold and bad weather that we've had. So we're grateful for those four property owners that were able to bring those properties into compliance. Our fire department um, was very busy again in February, 537 calls for service, which uh, was responded by 736 uh, fire units that went out for those service calls. Uh, one thing that we have had a big campaign on and want to bring attention to tonight is the smoke alarm installed. There was 189 smoke alarms installed in the month of February, 42 in January, which brings our total up to 231 for the first two months of 2019. In all of 2018, you'll see on the report there was 228 that were installed for the entire year. So we uh, are very pleased with the, the outcome of this uh, grant program. It will continue on. We want to make sure that every resident in Walker County has working smoke alarms. So if you don't have smoke alarms in your residence, you can contact our fire department and they'll send a couple of the guys out that will do a safety inspection and, and install those in the proper locations at no cost to you, uh, provided by a grant through Red Cross. Uh, roadside trash picked up was uh, 7,960 pounds. <coughs> we had 17 total nights booked in Mount Co Farm in February. Uh, single family home construction, there was, even with the bad weather, there were uh, nine permits pulled to start new construction on single family homes, and there was seven in the month of January. So very pleased with that number, that even with the bad weather and all the rain, there is a new single family home construction moving forward in Walker County. Um, media impressions and stories was actually, that was done by the media, whether it be the newspaper or our uh, local uh, news outlets. There was 49 media stories that were done for the month. There was 380 of you that we added as Facebook followers to our county Facebook account. Uh, Joe was uh, 59 posts for the month uh, sharing information about what's going on in Walker County. Over 30,000 visitors to our website and we were able to add 224 new subscribers to our free e-newsletter. E so if you're not a subscriber to the e-newsletter that goes out once a month, you can go to the county website. There'll be a screen pop that comes up. You simply just enter in your email address and that will add you to the list or you can go and look on the website and uh, the past uh, issues of that uh, newsletter is online for your review and you can download those, print them out, or view those. So that covers our statistics report. At this time, that will close out our regular scheduled meeting. At this time, we will open up the, the floor for anyone that would like to come to the podium. We will give you up to five minutes to discuss anything about uh, Walker County in general doesn't have to be about anything we've talked about tonight. Uh, any topic about Walker County, you'll have up to five minutes to come and address the public at this time. So who would like to be first? Yes, ma'am, right here. Come on up if you would please and state your name.
But what I would really like to ask y'all to do is just please think about the impacts that it has on us as neighbors. And you know, we've all been there a long time. I know that Jenny's family has been there over 100 years. And Mr. Bruning's family, he's been over 100, I think 23 years. So I mean, we have a lot of heritage in that land, you know, for sure. But please consider the impacts that it has on us. With number one, um, the second largest real estate company in Chattanooga has told me that it would degrade my property value by 20% if I'm lucky. You know, if I would even be able to sell it with, a, you know, a, a hotel campsite beside me. So that would really have a lot of impact on everything that we have worked for, our livelihood, all the money that we put in our house. It would just really ruin us. Um, second, we have so many safety and security concerns, you just wouldn't believe it. Um, I walk my grand puppy in my yard every day, several times a day, and so does my family. And if anyone can rent a yard at any time, I understand Mr. Johnson says he can do a review and see how those people are, but I don't really think that a review can tell you what you need to know about a person, where their heart is. Are they good, are they bad? Are they loud? Are they quiet? Do they drink? Do they party? Are they good people? I don't think a review is going to get to what we really need to know about those people. And when I'm outside playing in my yard with my grandpappy, you know, they could be just a few feet away from us. And that's really concerning for us. Um, and two, there's always the chance of trespassers because that's just human nature. That's just how we are. Um, and the property, there's really no place to hike over there. It's just a hill, a big open hill. It's beautiful. I mean, the campers could walk up and down that hill all they want to, but really and truly, if they have to go hiking, they're going to end up on Jenny's property or mine because those are the only trails that are up there, Mr. Whitfield. So we are just terribly, just deeply concerned about all that. Um, not to mention, um, here's a really big one, um, our peace of mind, you know, the quiet times that we have with our families. Um, we all work so hard every day. I've talked to all the neighbors. I've knocked on their doors. I've gotten to know them so well. And we all work so very hard. We work overtime to pay for our homes and take care of our families. And a lot of us were caretakers for our sick family members. So we are just tired at the end of the day. And like anybody else, we want to go to bed and go to sleep. But we know that no, the noise ordinance doesn't start until 11.30. So we would basically be at the mercy of campers. You know, whatever their mood was, whatever they were doing, if they were being loud or playing music, we would be at their mercy. But there's one thing I do know about campers because I am a camper. I have been a camper for about 15 years. I'm a member of a campsite in Swatty Daisy. So I can tell you I know about them. I've seen them, I've heard them, um, and it depends on the camper, of course. There are some really good ones that are, but there are some that are not. Okay, um, I've seen them drink, I've seen them have parties, I've seen them get in fights. There's been one that knocked on my door that thought it was his camper because he was drunk. But I mean, it, it does happen. Um, there's gonna be some major impacts as far as um, peace of mind. We may not have any. I won't be able to go sit on my front porch in peace and quiet. I'll be at the mercy of the campers, depending on what kind of mood they're in. Um, but the last thing I'd really like to say is please consider the message that you send out to everybody in Walker County. Because when I bought my home, I didn't foresee any time in the future a hotel being decided. Um, when I bought my home, it was done for residential. I felt safe and I felt secure and I felt I would never ever have to worry about anything like this ever. So please send out the message to people that live in residential areas in Walker County that you care about them and that you'll take care of them. And they don't ever have to worry about a hotel opening up beside them. But I would ask you to try to help Mr. Johnson too because I think he has a great idea. He's a really good person. But I just don't think it's the right place. If, if you allow him to do this, it hurts the neighbors that have already been there. It hurts us. Thank you, Mr. Thank you so much for coming. Let's speak. Okay. I just got a few things to add to that, and I guess I guess the biggest thing 
But I've got to add to it is, is uh, I know I can see you. I, this is the first meeting I've ever come to down here. I can see you all get your plates pretty well full. But if you would take a little time out and ask yourself, would you like to have tents in your backyard? And that's what we're going to have. Because my yard, I've got pictures here on my phone. I, I did have them, but I didn't bring them with me. That I've got glasses made. <coughs> what, you know, where these campers will be sitting, or where I think they'll be sitting. And to show you, I don't know why somebody would want to camp in somebody's backyard. I mean, ask yourself a question. Once you get there, what are you going to do? There ain't nothing you can do. It's get in your car and go to Chattanooga, or get in your car and go down to Cove. And most of them probably be sitting out in the sun. So, anyway, I appreciate your time, and uh, I think we're going to have another meeting with this on. Yes, yeah, I got your letter this week. She laid it on my desk, and so I'll, I'll be back in touch with you. We'll get a time. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Yes. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Very much. Okay, who would like to come up next? Yes. <clears throat> Well, they just signed in, folks, this uh, $15,000 to the magistrate court. I think it has a lot to do with what he just signed, Section 12, which takes away property rights, your property rights, taxpaying citizens. Any, this is under 12-6-1. Any person who willfully refuses to comply with the provisions of this article, Section 12, will be cited to appear before the magistrate court and upon conviction may be punished according to the provisions of Chapter 7, Section 7-18 of the County Chapter Charter. Where is that in this document? Where does it explain that in this document? It's not in there. Why? This document that he just signed gives so much control to the county government of your land. I tried to stop. I know there's some people here that affect they, some people that I've helped this past week. Has he kicked, he, he kicked scrap around his house because that's his income. But he's already been cited. That's part of his income. He separates the aluminum, the copper, and takes it, and he stores it. Yes, he stores a lot of it because he's waiting on it to go up so he can make some money for his family. I would like to ask everyone that agreed, understood this, and agreed with it to raise their hand. That, that, that disagrees, excuse me, that disagrees with this. Please raise your hand. Would you shine the camera around over there on these people that disagree with this ordinance, please, sir? Hold them up high, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a shame that that was signed into the law. Thank you, Mr. This, this is my name and number. I want, if, if I can give sure, it to you, and if you have any questions, concerns about this, that they're fixing to sign in, this, article, this section 34, please call his office, and I'm, get, I'm allowing them to, for that, his office to give anybody out there my number that's concerned about section 34. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Um, I've been a resident <clears throat> in Walker County for 10 years, and he does have a piece of a point, uh, but a small piece. I don't feel like we should be forced to um, not be able to scrap, because I am a scrapper. I actually junk cars. And the cars that I junk are in my yard and out of my yard within a week. I've never been in trouble with code enforcement. I do not hoard. Um, we keep our yard clean and cut. Uh, scrappers. Um, 
people that do small scrap don't make a lot of money. So if they're not junking a car, they don't have a large income. I think there should be some kind of, they should be given a right to put up a fence to hide their scrap. They should have that right to make that money because these guys that scrap work really, really hard when they're doing small metals. I have it easy, they don't. Um, I have people in my neighborhood that is not, they're not small scrappers. They steal appliances. There is garbage everywhere. There are doll heads on post. There is additions to a trailer that has never been permitted. It is open plywood in a neighborhood that I've lived in for 10 years and I've never seen this kind of stuff. I have yet to see a change be made. If somebody that is scrapping small stuff is getting punished, why is there no change in my neighborhood for this atrocious, awful house? And I have pictures. I have talked to code enforcement over and over again, and I have no problem with him. These little things that are going on with the county, I think are ridiculous. I think tearing down these houses that are falling in is perfect. I think the, the junk boats on Hogan Road that have been sitting there, the huge boats, the eyesore, they need to go. But I don't agree with punishing people with smaller incomes. I don't agree with that. I do agree with punishing drug houses and people that are junking our community up. I do agree with that. I think that it makes a difference that you look at this person's older, um, maybe not the best education, not easy for them to make money. Guide them, help them, let them put up a fence to cover up their junk. Not make them do away with their with their money. It's not fair. Thank you so much. I just wanted to mention real quickly uh, that there's a in Walker County that does an amazing job helping people. And I didn't know anything about it until about seven years ago. I went to a thrift store over here in Lafayette and I was looking for something and I saw all these people sitting in the lobby, about 20 people. And I, I was just looking around this little thrift store and then they, somebody called a number and these people got up and somebody walked out of the back room with this big load of food and took it out to the car and the people got up and went to their car and they were loaded with boxes of food, real staples. And I realized at that time, these people all need food. I mean, you know, I'm going around just oblivious to the fact that there's people here in our county that are going without food that need food. And so I just wanted to share real quick, just take a minute, I appreciate your, your patience, but the care mission um, is located just down the road by the railroad tracks. I'm not sure of the address. But uh, I, I, I inquired and I started volunteering there. And um, last year, they gave away $1.8 million worth of food to families in Walker County. I, they run this on a shoestring. And so I, I just want to let you know, be aware of it. Um, you know, going back to the lodge, we do help support them. Uh, but, you know, I just encourage you to find out about it because, you know, I've, I'm actually on the board at this point, but, you know, if you are looking for somewhere to make a difference, they are feeding thousands <laughs> of families in Walker County, and it's just amazing. They run it on a shoestring. They don't waste any money. It's just a great ministry that they do. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Okay, anyone else like to speak tonight? Yes, uh, Dave. I'll let her go for Okay, no, come on. Okay, sir. Are you so come on up. Boy. I'm pausing to sit on her lap for a moment, apparently. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am. That's hot. I have my hand up before you went to this meeting, um, I'm into this section. I've been asking for several months now, the dollars and cents for Mountain Cove Farm, and you had told me last fall that I need to wait till the end of the year 
and you would give the dollar amounts as opposed to just how many rooms have been booked. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see it then, and, I, and tonight we just heard how many rooms were booked again, but I, we would like to know how, how is it actually benefiting the county as far as dollars and cents. Do you yeah. have that information? I don't have it with me. We'll put it on the website tomorrow. Okay. All right, I will look for it then. Also on the ordinances, when people were voicing their concerns, it went back to these aren't new ordinances, but your platform has been, we're not doing things the way they used to be done, we're gonna do them better and move forward. So why aren't we addressing some of those that are such tiny little ordinances? And in addition to that, that we're, we're changing ordinances, we're upping the fees, which is atrocious, but we don't have the manpower or whether it's the skill, the knowledge, whatever, to enforce the ones we have now. They're not being enforced now. Some are, and you said we did over 9,000 citations, but there are people that have been reporting, and at the Rossville meeting, someone said for eight years, junk in someone's yard, and it's still there. So it's not being enforced. Why are we gonna take resources and manpower away from serious things that are affecting our county and address if somebody placed their trombone for an hour in their yard. How are you going to determine what gets enforced and what doesn't? Because it can't all be enforced at the same time. So that's my question on that. Yeah, that'd be the task for the code official. And that would be David Brown? Yes, sir. Okay. And based on that remark, well, what are, what are the guidelines in place for him and how he determines it? Is it just what he feels like doing? Or do you have priorities for our county for what is relative and what can wait? Because, <coughs> like Miss Brandy, who just spoke, she's had that problem down the street from her for a very long time, and she has a small child. And there are drugs there, and she's reported over and over and over. And the same with the people with massive junk vehicles, and instead of enforcing the laws that we have, we're gonna change it from three to zero. How is it gonna be enforced? What, what, is, what is the protocol for what code enforcement addresses? Well, they, work, they work off of complaints and they're also going and doing a, by zones that they're currently, they've been working on since uh, May of 2017. So what about the person that spoke at the Rossville meeting that said for eight years they've been calling about those cars piled up and nothing's been done yet. That's my point. We're not fully addressed, we're not fully enforcing the laws that we have, and then we have all these other laws and we're changing the laws to make them more strict, but we don't seem to have the ability to enforce the laws that we have. Anything else? Yes, go ahead. But I, think, I think you make a very, true and valid point here and the primary most important thing of what you're saying that is true is that we will not be able to full out enforce everything right mm -hmm. out there is not a chance because we would have to we probably have to hire 20 people and we simply right. don't have the funding to do it so and i start off by really accepting the premise of your question which is what how are we going to be able to do it all and the answer there is clearly, we are not gonna be able to go and do everything immediately. It's gonna have to build momentum, team. I mean, this is, a, this is a, an exercise here in going to the most, to the highest priority items that <coughs> best affect the state of our county moving forward. The vision that I hope, even if you disagree with, uh, some of the ways that we may go about it. I think we all share the common goal and vision of enhancing the beauty and enhancing the financial furtherment as we prepare for our next generations. I think everyone would agree with that, right? I mean, it, we all share that even if we have different ideas about how to go about it. So. I think Ms. Williams' comment that we're not going to be able to get everything at one time is absolutely accurate. And we ask for the support as we go to the highest priority items and help us build momentum 
to prosperity and cleaning up the county, it's going to be in small increments. It'll have to be by necessity. We don't have millions of dollars. I, that's I what, appreciate that's what my question was. When you said, as we go after the highest priority, that was my question to the commissioner. How are they prioritized? And and rather, because we do have significant large problems that are still we're still not able to enforce um, throughout the county in a lot of areas, particularly with uh, everybody's trash, big piles of trash, why do we keep addressing, I mean, okay, it's the 2004 ordinance, but if we're moving forward, why don't you do away with some of those? Or certainly not do $500,000 fines to add to, because you, there's nothing spelled out to the citizens on what you're going to enforce. And people in this room that are here, they know they're already, the laws are in place, but they're still waiting for it to be enforced. But in the meantime, you're saying, and now if you do this, this, and this, $500 don't even have to have a warning. $1,000 don't have to have a warning. And as a homeowner, our property taxes are up, our water bills are up, sales taxes are up. You're nickel and diming us and hundred dollar billing us to death, and now the new hotel motel tax. And I heard you say on television, we just learned that other places are taking advantage of this income, and we're not. We have people in our county, and and I have heard in talking with people, so many people say it's this administration's goal to drive the poor out of Walker County. And I, okay, and and I don't, I didn't know if that was true. But you're putting people into poverty, and you're not having, no new big businesses are coming here, but more and more and more is being charged to the citizen in every respect. And these fees, and I, I appreciate what Mr. Powell said about the excessive fees, the excessive fines. I don't know how you justify those numbers. How did you come up with those numbers, $500,000 for those fines? Would you like to? No, I'm asking you, Commissioner. Well, let me let me speak to this. We only got a few minutes. Everybody's been here a long time. Uh, what what we are attempting to do is, as Robert mentioned, is to clean up our community and start with the high priorities. And we haven't had the tools that our code enforcement have needed, and that's why we passed this ordinance tonight with Chapter 12 to give them the tools that's needed to start dealing with these blighted properties because we keep hearing from so many what a nuisance and uh, negative impact these are for communities. We want to make our community better. Right. But even on our other ordinances and the code enforcement's going after, they don't just walk in and, and cite someone a, a fine on the first visit. That's not our goal is to try to raise revenue by trying to get our, our But it's in there that there doesn't orders. even have to be a warning I'm talking now. talking about on the uh, just property maintenance enforcement they're going to give them, and we've been practicing this now for over two years, that every time an officer goes out, they're going to write a warning citation and give that property owner 30 days minimum to come into compliance. Uh, oftentimes, they're going to go back after 15 days as just a courtesy follow-up, uh, just for an encouragement to make sure that they realize the seriousness of it and also the fact to see if they are able to make progress. At the time when they go back after that 30 days, uh, they're going to be able to make an evaluation. We take uh, weather into account. We take any other extenuating circumstances that those individuals may have. Uh, sometimes you have people that, you know, clearly have had medical issues. There's a lot of things that can happen. So we give the officer there at the scene the discretion to extend that period of time if they feel like there's a willful intent to come into compliance. And if he needs to extend that time, he or she, they can, can do that and, and work with that property owner to get the property into compliance and give them the needed time that they, that they may be requesting to do so. You're saying that very community oriented, but the actual verbiage that you put down in writing in the ordinance is, you can do it without warning. Why did you put that in there? Ms. Williams, let, let me clarify that, that point though again. What you're talking about is section 34-658, unless I'm incorrect here. And just to reiterate that for you folks, uh, again, anything as you refer to your handout, and if you don't have one before you leave, you can have this one. Uh, that 501,000 verbiage, that isn't something that 
we decided on that that's already in the ordinance and so if we if we wanted to change that then we could discuss it that was my initial question with all of these ordinances and you're moving forward not backwards it's well no those were already there from 2004 well if you're looking at them and you're looking at them in earnest and you're trying to move in a particular direction get rid of some of those and by all means change that verbiage because you are taxing our county into poverty and now to say oh, that verbiage already existed then fix it that's what you're here for your that's points you're are well for. taken miss williams and the time is up okay. now thank, thank you. you very much <laughs> Anyone else who would like to speak on any topic of Walker County? Last call, anyone? Yes, oh, I'm sorry, David, I about forgot about you. Sorry, buddy. Uh, David Roden, um, I live in Rossville. So, at the risk of my own peril, I saw the hands that went up. And so I know I'm who I'm addressing. So I would have probably been the other hand that went up by itself. So I'll say that up front. Um, I don't. I'm not here to fuss with anybody. I'm not. On, I'm not here on behalf of them. I am a resident here for 30 years of Walker County as well. I have a business in Walker County on the north end. I am also a member of that 2030 advance team that I was invited to participate on to look and review the code. Uh, that we've been talking about tonight. Um, I'm one of, I think, five other community members that are part of that to address that. I am concerned with government coming in and telling me what I can and can't do on my property. I do not believe that government has the right to do a lot of things. So I am not are here to argue with any of you on that part. But I am on that committee, and I, and I volunteered to be on that committee with, with these other gentlemen and ladies because we have had a problem in our county um, with blight. If you come through the gateway from Chattanooga and through Rossville, I don't know that anybody, any of us could argue that we have some issues. Since we are so close to Chattanooga, that's probably our best location for investment to make our county prosper and grow. And if that part of the county will grow and expand, that will create some revenue. And if that revenue comes in like we would all hope it would, it may take some of the pressure off of our property taxes and some of the other fees that, that y'all mentioned tonight. Now, I know you're disagreeing with that, but that's my opinion. So again, I'm not here to argue with anyone, but what I'm, what I'm, I, I want you to understand that the 2030 advance team that the commissioner asked us to be a part of, we are not under anybody's thumb. Part of the discussion that y'all have had tonight, we are having right now. As we go through these as well, we will bring recommendations back to the commissioner and his team. Uh, we do not always agree on everything. I may not agree with you, and you may not agree with me, but, I, but what we're trying to do is make our county a better county. Now, how we all go about that, we may have different roads to travel. I think what we all have to agree on is what the destination is. And that's where I think the, the discussion is good. Now, I will also, as one member of that, that group, I will leave my phone number uh, with, with these folks up here, they have my information how to get a hold of me. I'm one member of that group. I would love to talk to you. I'll be glad to come to your property or you come to my business and I would love to discuss this and hear what your concerns are because I think that's how we adequately then are we're better prepared to bring back that to this in recommendations. So again, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not disagreeing with any of what you're saying, but we have to make the county better. And we have to do it in a way that invites new business, a new, invites people that want to buy our homes and not necessarily rent our homes, because we have a lot of out-of-town landlords that their, their renters are ruining your, their roads and my roads. And, and I think we can do all better. That's all we're trying to do is make our county better. 
So again, I, I welcome the conversation with you if you'd like to. I'll stay over, and, but call me at work, or call, and I'll and I'll talk to you. And I'm sure the other members will too. But thank you for your time and thank you, Mr. Thank y'all. Very good. Thank you. Well, hey, it's been a long evening, and I apologize for being a little warm in here and the scare of the door slam. But thank you so much. There's been a a lot of good uh, outcomes and a lot of good discussion. And so uh, we will adjourn this meeting and have a safe travel home.